for being here and for coming to our first uh, presentation at the Far Farmers Forum. Our first presenter is going to be Stu Jacobson, and you can see his presentation. The name is Increasing Production of Locally Adapted Disease and My Resist Resistant Bees. It's a topic of, that I, I'm sure that we're all going to enjoy. And he comes from Illinois. He represents the Illinois Queen Initiative. Um, I'm going to try to cover um, basically our organization, the Illinois Queen Initiative, of course, now I have to figure out how to get this thing to work. Yeah, about three years ago, there was only one person raising, raising queens in Illinois for sale. There were probably a few people raising queens for themselves, and maybe they gave a few away. There's still some people that do that. Um, now there's about 15 to 20, and we've trained over 100. A number of those people are still raising queens, but they're not selling them. And we're interested in changing, we're interested in a gradual genetic revolution, if you can have a gradual revolution, of, of, uh, of the gene pool of bees in Illinois and also in Missouri and other Midwestern states. And you can't do that unless you provide queens or, and or uh, small colonies or nukes for sale to people. I mean, giving them away is not sustainable. So if you don't have a means of providing those, then we're not gonna make changes. We're not gonna have a gene pool that's more adapted and more disease resistant to our local conditions. So this talk is a mix of what has been successful for us, plus a few ideas that I'm gonna, uh, suggestions I have about how to go about in your state or perhaps in your region, um, realizing this kind of thing. So I think I already addressed this question, but I have an article on the IQI in the Illinois Queen Initiative website. I wrote it several years ago. I haven't changed my thinking that much. So I have the, it's IllinoisQueenInitiative.com and the uh, URL or whatever it is it is at, on the last slide. Um, so we needed an organization to to train people how to raise queens because obviously you can't produce disease or local resistant queen, disease resistant or locally adapted queens unless you can raise some kind of honeybee queens. So right now we're still in that mode where we're trying to train more and more people. Um, in, and our organization is the means of carrying that out. So in our initial attempt, we identified initial goals and objectives. Our goal was basically to make that change of the gene pool in Illinois that I mentioned. How, we'll, how we're gonna accomplish tho those goals and objectives, mostly through workshops and decide on a structure. We, we decided on a state coordinator, that's me for now, uh, regional coordinators and a marketing chair, which is extremely <laughs> important. Um, and, and what we have discovered is that the strength of the organization is in the regions. It's in its different regions because that's where the different activities occur. And then we come together um, once a year for an annual meeting. So we need really hardworking, initiative-taking regional coordinators, not just uh, voting directors as occurs in some beekeeping and other organizations that sit back and kind of wait for other things to happen. They have to take initiative, setting up workshops, coming up with ideas, promoting the workshops, etc. In my opinion, it's probably best if an organization like this, this in this case our Illinois Queen Initiative, is independent of the, uh, the State Beekeeping Association Ohio did it the other way, and a new president came in the State Beekeeping Association, decided that uh, rearing queens adapted Ohio wasn't that important, pulled the funding. When I applied for my first SARE grant, we didn't even have a president of the State Association, and I knew the board well enough to know there's no way in heck that I'm going to run, I'm going to run the, the proposal through this board because they were mostly kind of cantankerous older folks, my age and older, which is pretty damn old. Okay. And I'm sort of going at 78 RPM because I, 
I'm not used to speaking for 20 minutes. Okay, so marketing is critical. I've become more and more convinced of this, that it, where we have not met our, our short-term goals of, let's say, training X number of people per year, it's because we haven't gotten the word out. So the marketing chair position is critical, and they need to develop a, a simple marketing plan, call it promotion if you will, but it is marketing, with the regional coordinators. A website's important, and ours is not well utilized. The webmaster is asking for content. We're not providing it. Our producer, so-called producer page is not viewed by beekeepers as a, as a resource, as a, go to, a place to go uh, to find queens or, or nukes. I don't think the marketing chair should be the, web, the webmaster, in part because webmasters, in my brief experience, tend to love their product or their art as everybody else does, and you need someone else to say, this needs to be changed. So it, it needs to be two different people. Um, we need to get more articles out via the State Association newsletter and their website. They've been cooperative with us. And we uh, recently discovered that we need to do more on the ground, going to local or regional beekeeping associations, give talks, promoting our, um, our queen initiative and promoting our workshops. So I've got to, well, I think I have about 15 minutes. One thing that I, um, I realized when I was sitting down thinking about how to put this talk together is, I think what I'm talking about is applicable to, to groups that might be promoting uh, brood stock or, or, yeah, brood stock for let's say grass-fed beef, where they're selecting a certain genotype that is, which is, works better on grass than your average beef cow, or pasture-raised hogs, or pasture-raised chickens. So we ha I think we have something in common with that, those kinds of organizations. I know some exist on the national level. I don't know if any exist on the state level. So we've also learned, and this is kind of obvious, but <laughs> we had to learn ourselves, that the timing of the workshops and the locations of the workshops <coughs> are really important. For one thing, if you're going to do a workshop on queen rearing, you have to do it early enough in the season that the, the folks who take the workshop have an opportunity to practice those methods, but that it's not so early that, you, that it's unrealistic, that you can't pull a honeybee uh, very young larvae, extraordinarily young larvae, in order to graft. You can't really do it in, in most of Illinois, probably in April. The weather is too iffy. And I would suggest that may be true in much of Missouri, except maybe the boot hill. Uh, it's important to teach practical methods of small scale queen rearing initially. Get people trying it, trying it out. Whatever you can do to get them involved in, in producing queens or producing nukes, which are small colonies with a queen, is more important than trying to jump them to some sort of semi-commercial level. For example, we're going to start teaching the cell punch method, and I can talk to people about what that is. But it's a lot simpler. It's a lot easier to learn than than the traditional grafting method, especially for some of those that are increasingly uh, visually challenged. It, it, it's just a lot easier to do, and it's a more natural, a more natural, less disruptive process. The Miller method is actually a process where you, you uh, get bees to draw out cells in natural comb. You don't even, you never even move the larva out of, until until it's actually about, it's no longer a larva, it's about ready to emerge as a queen, all right? So those are simple methods that are not used by the big commercial folks, but that work very well for producing several hundred or more queens a year, which is more than most of us are probably going to do. It's important to conduct follow-up or troubleshooting workshops <coughs> a month <coughs> or six weeks after the initial one so that people that have gone out and tried 
can share their successes, or if they've not had success, they can learn from those that have been successful about the techniques and the methods in queen rearing. Queen rearing is not that difficult, but it takes practice, and it does take encouragement or ideally a mentor. Where's Nadia? Is, oh, how much time do I have? Okay, okay, I'll try to dial back a little bit. Uh, one thing we, we've, we've done is to acquire a number of potentially resistant or promising stocks to, to uh, evaluate, and I won't mention several of them, not, not because, mostly they, they just didn't survive that well initially, and I think it wasn't the genetics. It was some combination perhaps of the, of the qu queen rearing at the, at the time we acquired those queens, or, or that lot of queens. Include, we did get buckfast from Canada, for instance, um, and perhaps the sh shipping. We got a lot from Pennsylvania that came through very poorly in June when there was a heat wave, and they didn't last very long at all. Actually, half of them arrived dead, but the other half that came to me didn't last very long. Uh, so what we're going to focus now is vro on varroa-sensitive hygienic. I don't know how many of you have read um, but unfortunately, the source of the varroa sensitive hygiene line, which was developed by the USDA with our tax dollars, the source, the single source where you can buy these queens, has decided to retire. He and his wife are getting up there, and they have some, I, apparently, their parents or some of their parents are still alive. There's some family health issues. I haven't seen his article or what he put out. This is a critical issue because the history of developing honeybee lines in this country is not very good once they go from a university or a government agency like the USDA out to the industry. It hasn't worked well. The only person that's been able to have a sustainable system is Sue Kobe, who's now sort of between Washington State and UC Davis. Marla Spivak's line, a great line, the, the, the Minnesota Hygienic should now be uh, called the East Texas Hygienic, and you don't want to buy something from Texas. Enough said as far as I'm concerned. She's gone on to do some other things, but that line is not lost, but is imperiled. And there's, in, the, in the past, there, there have been other examples. So this could be a real problem. Survivors are critical, or not a critical, they're a key resource. Yes, they are critical also. They're an extremely important resource. And I'm defining survivals more or less the way Larry Connor does, which is they've gone four years without any treatment, and they've survived well. It's not that they've come through weekly, weekly in, in weak form, small population, or so-called so dinks, that are luck, going to be lucky to survive uh, a wet spring, let's say, a cool wet spring, much less make you any honey. But they're coming through after four or more years without treatment as strong colonies that will make honey for you. Those are survivors. We've got two, two uh, sources in Illinois that are go have gone over 10 years. I'm working with one of them. The other one, uh, I've had difficulty getting, getting stock from, but I hope to next year. Um, in contrast, commercial sunbelt queens or uh, bees, I mean bees that have descended from queens raised in the sunbelt, almost always have to be treated every year. By, if they're not treated in year one, <clears throat> they're probably going to die by year two. And you look at some of the studies that were done by one of these USDA projects where they set up about eight different apiaries in eight different states. They used commercial stock. The stuff didn't make it very long at all. Okay, genetics obviously are really important. Um, to be sustainable, to survive for the long run, queen producer organizations like ours have to promote locally produced queens. This should become the focus of the marketing, of the website, of most of the articles that are written. 
in Illinois, and I would venture to say most likely in, in, in Missouri, perhaps to a lesser extent uh, because of the nature of the landscape, the Ozarks and what have you, the vast majority of honeybee genetics come into Illinois, have come in historically into Illinois, meaning over the past 30 years or more, in the form of packages and the queens that are in the packages. That's what we've got except for the ferals, which, are, which underwent a, a huge loss, a genetic kind of bottleneck because of varroa, but have come back strong, and many of those, of course, are survivors. Oh, and by the way, when we use chemicals, many of you know this, but there's a fair amount of evidence, increasing evidence, that when we use chemicals, whether it's um, Thailand, which is an antibiotic, or um, uh, try, trying to think of the two hard, harder chemicals that we used to use a lot for mite control. My mind is having a senior moment. They af negatively affect the immune system of bees. So we're, we're treating against mites. At the same time, we may be weakening their capability to fight off viruses and to fight off Nosema serrana, which is an, a significant problem in some areas. Another point, I, well, I don't have time to belabor, but it's critical. Beekeeping organizations, state beekeeping organizations, local ones, beekeepers, organizations like ours, Eat Queen Initiative, have to address the dangers of Africanized genetics being brought up north. We're bringing them in in packages. I'm going to say right now, and I don't know how many people I'm going to offend, anybody who brings in who buys packages or queens from Texas and increasingly from Florida is, is doing serious damage to the future of beekeeping in their state. Serious damage. Because we get a few stinging incidents of dogs or God help us of a child or an older infirm person who can't move out of the way because they bought a queen from Weaver in Texas the neighbor did, who has colonies, or they bought a package. There's a guy in St. Louis who buys packages from, from Weaver, thinks there's no problem with it, right? That will result in restrictive regulations about beekeeping. We've seen a huge popular interest in bees, a lot of support for beekeeping. That's going to disappear if we have many incidences like that. The Three Rivers Beekeepers in St. Louis area, they no longer is an example of what we can do, what is capable, um, or what organizations can do, what we as a group of beekeepers are capable of doing. They no longer buy uh, nukes or small colonies from, from um, the south, from Florida, but they, they're producing these nukes within their, their club within their organization, and they prioritize new beekeepers. So they start out with strong stock, and they're utilizing locally raised, or, or at least in-state raised queens. And that's part of that gradual genetic revolution I was talking about. Sunbelt genetics are really not sustainable. Let me just show you one or two slides quickly. This is just an example of selecting stock for, uh, by testing for hygienic behavior. Um, the, this is what happens with non-hygienic stock. You free, I'll show you a picture in a moment, but this is a, a soup can cut out, poured into here, liquid nitrogen was poured in here, killed all the brood. Non-hygienic bees, they don't, they don't respond. This is what a hygienic one does. Is this, is this my? All right, here's a picture of us doing that. Here's the soup can. It's, see, it's silver because it's really cold. Um, liquid nitrogen is really cold, and no, you can't do this with CO2. Um, this is a 64 ounce, I think, two quart uh, Stanley stainless steel thermos. It, it is good for, for carrying liquid in. It doesn't last very long, and you have to put a hole in the top for it to boil out because otherwise you have an unguided missile in your vehicle which <laughs> but 
but it, it's, it's a kind of a piece of appropriate technology. All right, there's, there's the liquid end boiling off in action. All right, um, that's it. Do I have any time? We have time for questions. Okay, and here's the website I talked about. All right, here's my email address if you want to email about something. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, like, uh, Corey Stevens down in uh, the Cape Girardeau area. Yeah. Would That's everybody please? here. Maybe okay. you should comment. Sorry, we have to. Okay. Up in this region, uh, is it still advisable to buy from someone down like in the Cape Girardeau area, far more preferable than getting a nuke from out of, uh, say, Florida? Yeah. I would say... Please use the mic. Oh. Sorry, I'll, I'll be in between you. Okay. Thank you. I would say uh, yes. I would also say the more local, the better. So I, I actually lived a year up in northwest Missouri, wherever the heck that is up there. Tarkio, which is a little tiny bird. The conditions up there are like Iowa and Nebraska. They're somewhat different from, they're rather different probably, from the boot hill. But the closer you can get, the better, all things being equal. And he might have better stock than someone local too, in the sense of his, the, the, the actual rearing of the queens and other factors. Yes. I would just, I'm going to point out that what you're trying to avoid, correct, is Africanized stock. That's why the, the directive is not to buy from, from the southern states. It's because of that, that genetic stock, which we're not experiencing here, right? I don't know if we're experiencing. Um, yes, that's one piece. That's the sort of negative of buying from the Sun Belt. Increasingly, from not all Sun Belt states at the moment, not even all of Florida, I think, at the moment, but I don't want to gamble on that. But the positive side for, for purchasing locally produced stock is ideally that locally produced stock has some input from feral colonies. And so those colonies are, those bees are better adapted to the climate, to the winter particularly, or maybe to the spring slow wet springs that we get frequently, at least in central Illinois. And also even to, and some of the local pathogens, and also to the floral characteristic, the timing of major flows. So there's those two main reasons, apart from the support local and all that kind of thing, those two main reasons why I would try to buy as local as you can. Are we out? One last question because we have to move to the next. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question regarding uh, the use of multiple hives from different sources that are all survivors to try and combine gene pools or gene traits from different, is that something you're looking at doing? Uh, you mean multiple colonies or multiple genetic, yeah, yeah, that's a really good idea because in theory it's possible that you could draw from a source, I wouldn't say that's inbred, but where the, the gene pool has been somewhat restricted, again, because of what happened with Varroa 20 some odd years ago, or maybe it's pushing 30, where the, we, we have pretty good evidence the feral colonies, the feral population just shrunk to almost nothing. People weren't getting swarm calls. Uh, there just wasn't much going on. And, and so that's called a genetic bottleneck. So, it could be in a given area the the diversity, genetic diversity is somewhat restricted. So if if I can pull, in my case, there's a guy that lives um, half an hour, 40 minutes from me. If I'm pulling from his stock, it's gone t 10 years without, um, without treatment. And if I can finally get this guy who lives down in Vandalia, which isn't too much farther, to uh, if I can get some stock from him, that's really desirable. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I think the concern about lack of diversity is a little bit overplayed, but it's there's good evidence that diverse diverse colonies, genetically diverse colonies, resist uh, diseases better than ones that aren't. <laughs>